Hey, Nicholas, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. Well, I'm glad we're connected today. Um, I appreciate you being here. Welcome to the Ozark Mount Publishing author series. And today it's your turn to talk about your book, uh, Living Living the Life Force. And That's right. uh, but before we before we begin, uh, please tell me a little bit more about yourself, and uh, we'll start there uh, from there. Well, I'm English for a start. So I was brought up and born in England, and uh, had a fairly traditional upbringing in England, and. Uh, um, and went into advertising after going to college. Um, and then uh, I was invited by someone to go off to India for a, uh, a holiday uh, that turned out to be a, a 15 day circular trek in Nepal. And uh, I went uh, on this trek and it was, you know, these treks are arduous. They, you know, you have to sort of take all your gear with you and all that sort of business. So we went up 14,000 feet up the mountain and um, I just had the most amazing experience. I looked out over the Himalayas and these great peaks were coming through as if they were great sort of icebergs coming through the clouds. And I just had an experience of, wow, um, just an amazing experience. And I came back and I, I didn't really think much had changed. But um, uh, my mother told me that when I got off the plane uh, wearing Indian clothes and claiming to be vegetarian, she knew <laughs> that something had changed and that. And that really started me on this whole spiritual uh, uh, track. And I, I became very focused on, on the sort of spirituality side of things um, and sort of, you know, got meditation classes and courses and all that sort of business. And, you know, really I became very interested indeed. And then in, in England, I did one of those, uh, I think you have them over here, they're called EST, uh, Air Heart Seminar Trainings, one of those three-day trainings did one of those, again, had a big experience on that training and uh, then wanted to become a trainer. And so spent 10 years working as a trainer in one of those, those sort of enlightenment type organizations. And all those organizations, quite funny, what they did was they, 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 some of them had some bad publicity, but the businesses loved them because they got the corporate people really behind all the sort of uh, boardrooms, communicating well and and identifying with the corporate structures. So all those sorts of organizations went into business. And I found myself, you know, 10 years down the line, again, working in marketing advertising, and I didn't really fancy that. And so I then thought, you know, where do you go to talk about God? And they don't think you're bonkers. They don't think you're mad. And I sort of realized that actually the church in England was the place where you do that because you get a salary, uh, you get a house, uh, you get a place where you can you know, strut your stuff around a church or whatever it is. You get a pension at the end of it. It seemed, you know, quite a good deal. And uh, so I sort of went into the church on that basis. And I was amazed when I went in there to find that there was a whole contemplative meditative tradition. So I just sort of slotted right in. And I found that there's an old expression in England, if you, uh, you can do anything so long as you don't frighten the horses. And I was able just to get my language right and didn't really frighten anybody. And uh, and so ended up in the Church of England as a priest. And I did that, uh, trained in Durham, and then went to my first parish in Tunbridge Wells, which is in England, and was there for four years. And then went to another parish in Norfolk in England, uh, in Norwich, and was there for 13 years. And my wife and I looked around and looked at each other and thought, well, let's have a, another challenge. Um, and I'd written my first book, uh, Developing Consciousness, in, in England, uh, in, from England, and I'd written it in America. I went to Albuquerque and wrote it there, and we quite liked America, living in America, so I looked at the Episcopal website, and there was this uh, job going in a place called Aspen Chapel, uh, which wasn't actually an Episcopal church at all. Uh, it's a non-denominational church, and, you know, I w went for the job. I've been here eight years now. And it's a very sort of open environment. I mean, I've just done a series on the 10 ox herding pictures, which is a Zen type stuff. And so I, I find I can really sort of talk in any particular side of the spiritual world. And that's that's very liberating and freeing. No one comes up to me and said, well, you haven't mentioned Jesus for two weeks. You know, they'll they'll let me just uh, do whatever I want to do. And so I've now ended up now. I'm in Aspen. I've been here eight years and uh and uh, running this. So, Nicholas, tell me a little bit then, how did the book Living the Life Force come about? Well, you know, my first book was called Developing Consciousness. And that, you know, when I first started um, 
in on this whole sort of game. I and mean, you, you call it the enlightenment business, really. The interesting thing was that there, there just wasn't anything that said, well, these are the areas you need to pay attention to. If you're in, you know, if you're interested in enlightenment, you know, this is what you should do. And I thought, well, someone needs to write a book, sort of a, a sort of roadmap of the journey to enlightenment that said, look, if, you, if you're on the subject of spirituality, you need to be aware of consciousness, you need to be aware of your mind, you need to be aware of the nature of spirituality and a whole load of different stuff. So I wrote this basic book, which was about the, which is a primer on enlightenment. So having wrote that and having got here, I then realized the next stage really was how do you live within that context? You know, if you're in that game, you're in the enlightenment game, and if you're committed to it, what is it that you need to do in order to sort of surf your way through the whole experience of spirituality? So living the life force is really about how you live a spiritual life and, you know, what are the most important things to, to, to be aware of? This lovely definition of spirituality by someone called Rowan Williams. And he defines spirituality as the, the cultivation of a sensitive and rewarding relationship with eternal truth and love. And, and I love that because, first of all, it's a cultivation. It's sort of agrarian. You've got to keep on doing the stuff. It's the cultivation of a sensitive. In, in, in other words, it can't be abusive. A sensitive and rewarding in that it's enriching. And then, you know, very importantly, it's a relationship. Spirituality is not a thing. It's a relationship. Um, and the relationship is with eternal truth. And, you know, I talk a bit about what that is in the book and love. And I talk a bit about, about what that is in the book. So I wanted to, to really write down how you do that. How do you live a, a relationship with eternal truth and love? And that's really what the book's about. Um, can you maybe give us some examples? Well, yeah. I mean, if you start at the beginning of it, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I'll start really with, with, with where we start. I'll, get, I'll give you my pitch uh, uh, on that. And the pitch is really this: it's that that the idea is that we are in uh, an evolution. You know, there's creation, there's evolution, and we are involved in evolution. And evolution really started at the Big Bang, I and mean, we could say that's where it began. And I would put the idea there that that really the Big Bang, you know, happened, uh, you know, in a situation where there, there wasn't any return from it. It just it just sort of happened. I've got a definition of love. Uh, my definition of love is giving with no expectation of return. That's giving with no expectation of return. So in a sense, the universe was given with no expectation of return, you know. And then gradually what happened, you know, there was a, a development, there was an evolution that happened and uh, the planets arrived and the earth arrived and then, then uh, you know, sort of life came about, plants, animals, and, and all those things were given with no expectation of return. And now, you know, in a sense, we're given our lives with no expectation of return. And so we're given our lives in love. So in a sense, what I'm actually saying here is that our role in life is to really give ourselves in love, give ourselves with no expectation of return. And in doing that, we sort of become one with that basic currency or foundational nature of the universe, which is that of giving. I mean, the second thing I'd want to say about it is that for me, evolution is about the evolution of consciousness. And that the Big Bang was the, you know, in a sense, the birth of consciousness. And, you know, I would want to say that consciousness, you know, is about the, the relatability of things. So in a sense that the Big Bang, you know, there's bits of rock and bits of atoms were relating to each other. Even if it was in an insensient way, there was a relatingness going on. And that relatingness developed into the foundation of planets and the foundation of the earth and you know, gradually, as that relatedness went on and went into life, that relatedness became much more what we would think of as consciousness. And then that consciousness developed in plants, in animals, animal consciousness, and, and then finally into human consciousness. And I'd want to put the idea forward that, you know, we are 
the, uh, the, the sort of end point of consciousness in that not only are we able to feel, see, all that sort of things, but we are also able to self-reflect. Uh, and that's a, that's a key move. And, and to that extent, you know, that idea I'd want to put forward is that we are the universe made conscious of itself. So we were flying around as atoms in at the Big Bang, whatever it is, and now suddenly it's all come together, and here we are. We are in consciousness. We are in a situation where, uh, you know, we are able to be conscious of what's going on, um, and and we are that high point of consciousness. So if you look at that journey, the next stage of evolution, I would want to say, is not my son developing an extra thumb for fast texting. You know, my uh, understanding is that the next stage of evolution is involved in the evolution of consciousness uh, and the evolution of uh, the, the consciousness recognizing itself. Um, and I would want, want to say that that's how we're in that place right now. And that links in with the love thing in that really we are now in, in a role. And, if, and I think it's interesting if you look at the way that civilization has developed from the sort of grunting animals that were humanity at the beginning through to you know, development of you know, agrarian villages, cities. You know, you had idiots that came along and had wars, but basically civilization has been developing evolution of, of conscious has developed in education. And, and we're now at, a, at that point in our society where, you know, we can make that contribution to the ev evolution of consciousness through, you know, being the best we can in our, in our most loving way. And therefore, arrive at a recognition. And that recognition is, you know, that deepest spiritual truth that we in the universe are one. There is this there is one beingness, uh, that there, are, there is no other. You know, the guru was asked, you know, what do we, how do we look after others? And the guru said, there are no others. And that we are one with the universe. And in, in us being one with the universe, the way that we are in our consciousness, the way that we, that we express ourselves changes the nature of overall consciousness. And really the book is about how that happens. You know, Eva, um, as you were talking uh this might not be obviously relating directly to the book, but just in the position that you are in, people that are looking f for a um, for something, right? Because they feel like they're missing it. Uh, do you find that they they look for it, and it has to be sort of the word of God, or is it just enough for it to be different different enough to just blow their minds? So it doesn't necessarily have to have that deity attached to it. Well, I mean, God's a very unhelpful word, I think. I mean, I think that, you know, the moment you say the word God, what you think of is some old man in the sky with maybe a person sitting next to it. You know, God's really, I mean, my view is that religion is really a cultural interpretation of an experience that somebody has had. And so I, I wouldn't want to really talk about God. Um, I'd want to really more talk about, you know, the gr a ground of all being, a, a sort of spiritual DNA. I mean, I like the idea, you know, of a cosmic ordering, that there is a fundamental spiritual DNA at the center of all things. And that just like DNA, you know, I think DNA is a very interesting thing, you know, desoxyribonucleic acid. You know, DNA is the organizing principle uh, in, in life, in humanity. And DNA really is about you know, it's the foundational cooperation between the cells within us that, that creates life. And I think that, that fundamentally there is a, a spiritual DNA at the center of all things. You know, in Christians, we might call it the Christ nature. You know, they might call it, you know, Taoists will call it the Tao. Uh, um, you know, Buddhists and, 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 and Hindus, you know, might, might call it something else. So, you know, all different religions call it in, in different ways. But there is a, a fundamental urgingness forward of a spiritual DNA that makes that come about. And for me, that's the most interesting thing. I mean, here we have a sort of strap line here, which is, you know, when people say, what are you about here? I mean, my view is what we're about here is that how do you live your life more skillfully? How do you live your life more skillfully? And I think that if you understand the context within which you live, then you're able much more to live your life much more skillfully by, by doing that. So, 
in a sense, the whole idea of living the life force is about being in contact with that spiritual DNA and allowing it to express itself through you. So, Nicholas, um, I wanted to ask in your book, do you sort of have um, steps for people that are just now learning about these things and getting into uh, spirituality and wanting to know more? Do you give a, um, a order of steps, such, sort of uh, like a one, two, three step for somebody to uh, who is not confident about, am I doing this right? Am I, am I learning these things the right way? Um, um, do, uh, do, is there such a thing in your book? Yes. Um, the way that the book works is it starts uh, uh, really at the beginning with, you know, what's going on. And I think it's important to put everything in a context of what is going on in our world at the moment. And then from that, it, it takes us to what our place is within what's going on and then describes how we interact with it. So there's a theoretical idea of what's going on and then it places us within that that environment of what's going on. And then the second thing I do in the second half of the book is that I look at the, the evolution of consciousness and how each of us and how society itself has evolved from basic um, infant consciousness, which is really saying, you know, give me food, give me sex, give me all that sort of business as a basic infant consciousness that then moves into sort of magical consciousness and then mythical consciousness, rational consciousness. It just shows the way that our consciousness transforms as we go through the years. Um, and I think that people can find themselves in those different places and identify where they are in relationship to those different levels of consciousness. So I think more it enables us to the book is there to position ourselves within the greater cosmic reality. Where am I? You know, what's going on out there? Where am I in relationship to that? And then it will give some basic ideas as to what we can do to, to actually attune ourselves to live in a more sort of productive way. And so when you initially... Uh, wrote the book, then would you say that you were almost kind of like um, uh, had just graduated from this understanding that you were like, okay, it's time for me to write about this because you in a way went through these steps yourself? I think that's true. I think that it is absolutely true. I mean, I would not have been able to write this book 10 years ago. I would not have been able to write this book 10 years ago. And I think the key thing for me, uh, you know, the, the most, it, I always, when people come talk to me, I say, where does the rubber hit the road spiritually for you? And for me, the rubber hits the road in my uh, in, in meditation. And this book came out of the work that I have done in meditation. And I think that the, the journey we have to take is from our, our heads, our minds being in charge. And most of the time, our minds are in charge. You know, our minds are telling us what to do, you know, how we can get on in life, what's best in life. And in meditation, it takes us down to our hearts and we open that heart nature. And we do that by focusing not on our thoughts and our minds, but focusing maybe on our breath or on a mantra or in a candle. And what you gradually do in focusing on that candle, in focusing on that mantra, in focusing on that breath, is you grow your heart capacity. And in growing your heart capacity, you grow a different way of knowing. And it is the knowing from the heart rather than knowing from the mind. Um, and I think that that's what I've done over the, this last period of time is grown from the heart rather than from the mind. And I've had the freedom to explore here. I've not been sort of, you know, people don't say to me now, OK, right, we need, you, uh, we need a sermon on the parable of the sower. Or, we, you know, I mean, they don't make me do that. So what I can do is to do some much more interesting exploration of, of, of what the nature of development might be. And that's enabled me to explore. And we've just done a series here on the 10 ox herding pictures, uh, just looking at you know, how those Zen 10 ox herding pictures show the different stages of enlightenment. And you can find those, uh, uh, those, those talks and things like that at, um, at our, our website, aspenchapel.org. And there's a video library and you can just see that. And there are podcasts as well on those subjects on Apple. If you put Aspen Chapel into the Apple podcast list, uh, then uh, you'll get that. 
You know, what would you recommend somebody that's reading your book and um, as often humans get so impatient because they, ex they have expectations of, well, this is not happening quick enough or I don't see the changes or I don't understand this. What advice can you give? <clears throat> Well, I think the first thing you want to say is that this is going to, it's not going to sound good, this, but first thing I want to say is that actually, you know, the thing you get very quickly is, is there is nowhere to be, there is nowhere to go. Um, and it's a, it's a realization of that um, that is at the center of all spiritual development. It's a realization that there is nowhere to go. And when you start, you think, oh, I want to get enlightened. I want to have this experience. I want to have that experience. I want to, you know, I, I want to, to, to almost consume me. I want to gain this. I want to have a seeing the light experience, a pull on the road to the Marxists. I want to be like the Buddha. I want to get my Buddha nature all tuned up and, you know, organized and so that I can be, you know, guru Buddha, all that sort of business. You know, that, there's an acquisitionness about that. And I think, the realization is there is nowhere to go is is quite a big thing in giving us all patience in moving forward and you know when you say to people on a spiritual journey there is nowhere to go say oh yeah yeah i, I know but, but really tell me what, what really what, what what am i doing you know, <laughs> really what, what what is it about you know i know there's nowhere to go but come on what's the, what's the real stuff you know what do you, what do you really want to say and really you know there is no substitute for you know, staying in your meditation practice. I mean, the key thing I would say above everything else is you have to start a meditation practice. There is just no getting away from it. You know, it, you have to start a practice. I mean, that practice, you know, I live in the mountains here. That practice can be, you know, it doesn't have to be sitting there, you know, oming away, you know, all that sort of business. You don't have to do it like that. I think it is easier but some people do do their meditation walking along in the mountains. Some people do their meditation in different sorts of ways. However it is, you know, what you have to do, and I do say this in the book, you have to um, set a time aside. And this time is for giving house room to that divine, to, you know, to that life force. I'm going to set this time aside and I'm going to open myself to that life force. And for the next 15 minutes, it's going to be about nothing but that life force. And in doing that, I'm not going to think about it, but I am just going to follow my breath or I'm going to walk this road or I'm going to do whatever I'm doing for my practice. And I am not going to indulge my thoughts. I'm not going to be thinking about this and thinking about that or even thinking about my practice. I am going to be focused on just opening my heart. And, you know, when you do that, gradually, you know, your heart does begin to open. And when your heart begins to open, then um, you start to see life in a different way. And I think you have to have the patience, you know, to keep going. I've been on this game since 1979. Now, what was the year now? 2023? So that's 79, 89, 99, 109, 119, 21, to 45 years nearly. I've been on, the game, on this game. And I think you, you're just going to have a long view on this. And, you know, when you do it, you'll find if you do sort of persevere, you will find that books come your way, courses come your way, people come your way. You know, they always say that you don't find the path. The path finds you. You don't find the path. You know the path finds you. And as, as you open yourself to being called by the path, you recognize the signs of the path going like this. You see the path and you just move along that. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say is that um, in my personal experience and many times you know, that I've talked to hundreds of different people that have written books, had experiences, you know, um, People listening, I don't think they understand the basic importance of meditation. They always think, okay, that, well, that's great. Is there anything else I can do? It's almost like, you know, you always want to jokingly say, yeah, sure. Just, you know, s you know, stand on your head for three, three minutes, you know, and then do a swirl and then the answers will come to you. You know, it's, um, uh, they just don't see that as, as simply a, um, 
truly the key to to begin somewhere you know it's like they always just think of it because it's been so it's been used in movies and other places and they hear it so many times they don't realize like truly just sit and 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 breathe i totally agree with you i mean you're absolutely right on that i mean i think it, it's you know it is the, it, it's the fundamental development and, and i think this is where the evolution of consciousness comes from it is evolving you know in my book i talk about evolving from rational consciousness where you think about everything where you think about what's going on how it's all happening thing to visionary consciousness you know gandhi was one of visionary conscious where you think the possibilities of the future to the evolution to soul consciousness where you become an expression of that nature now in order to become an expression of that spiritual DNA, whatever you like to call it, in order to become that, what you have to do is get out of the way. And your mind is, you know, so useful, so brilliant, so fantastic. Ram Das always said that the transformation that needs to take place is where your is to go from the place where your heart serves your psychodynamics, in other words, your mind, and most people, their hearts serve their mind, You've got to change that run to where the, their psychodynamics, their mind, serves their heart. And the heart has to take charge of the situation. And I think that, you know, that is the transformation that you needs to take place. And when you go into that visionary conscious, when you get out of the way, when your mind gets out of the way, then suddenly your heart can come through. And then you can become, you become an expression of that heart nature that is that you become an expression of that spiritual dna you know thomas Merton famously says that famously says that you know a word cannot understand the person that uttered it but if you can become the word that god has uttered in you if you can actually become that uh, then you become a, a different sort of expression so nicholas in conclusion is there anything else you would like to finish off with regarding the book well, you know, I think that this journey is the journey that, that all humanity needs to take. I mean, you know, it sounds ridiculous, but this is the, this is the direction that people, you know, n need to go in their lives for us to transform this world. I mean, you know, we're in a situation where it's more and more important that the world begins to look after itself. I mean, you know, you look at the fact that, you know, nowadays... We have climate change. We have 80 million refugees around the world. We have all these things going on at the moment. And somehow we have to get to a point where, as a world, we begin to look after ourselves. You know, we've got to stop killing people. Humanity has that, to stop killing people. And in order I to do that, that... Sorry? I was saying I agree. That's, that's a very good point. I mean, we're the only, look at this, you know, if you look at the DNA, look at the DNA of life, it's all, it's all going along, right? And, it, uh, and we're one bit of it. Humanity is one bit of that DNA. And what's happening is that we're the one bit that's not cooperating. We're sort of strangling it all, you know, we're, we're killing each other, we're killing the planet. It's got to stop. You know, we've got to start, you know, China's problems are our problems. Our problems are China's problems. There is one thing to say to handle every single problem in the world there's one thing that you can say that will totally transform every single situation that exists in the world and that thing you can say is how can i help that should be the response in all situations that we give how can i help what can i do what is it that I can do? We need to develop that spirit of cooperation in our world. And the first thing we need to do is stop killing each other. Uh, and, and really, the book is about how to do that. Well, Nicholas, thanks very much for your time today. Um, I'm, of course, going to have all your links in the description below this video. So if people want to learn more about you and know where to get the book, the links will be in the bottom. And, uh, well, thank you again. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm jealous that hopefully maybe this year we might be able to take a vacation to Colorado. Oh, not this year, next year, 2023. So uh, 
but I don't know. It's still still in the works. Well, you'd be so welcome. Do come see us. That'd be absolutely fantastic. I'd love that. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Well, thanks again, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, you take care of yourself. Thank you.